Alan Blass. I'm the president of the Palm Beach County chapter of Certified Fraud Examiners. And I've been a CFE since 1992 and now president of my third chapter, first New York, then Miami, and now Palm Beach County. This program has been so fantastic since we just opened our new chapter this year. And thanks to EOD and Open Thinking Academy and this great program for 12 weeks, all with great speakers, we've been able to grow our chapter to 80 members during this very difficult time. So thanks again. Enjoy the, today's presentation from Daryl Nair, one of our board members in Palm Beach County. It's very nice to greet you, and I hope to meet you one day. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Daryl Nyer. Uh, I am here to present uh, with Eric uh, a presentation on healthcare fraud. So let's get this started. Um, I have 20 years experience uh, in the New Jersey uh, prosecutor's office. I retired from the prosecutor's office and went to a top uh, 200 accounting firm uh, that has uh, national and international exposure. Uh, in 2019, uh, I re took my equity buyout and retired from there, and I joined uh, my wife, who owns a CPA firm uh, in Florida. So what I want to talk to you a little bit about is globalization. And so globalization is really the free movement of goods, services, capital around the world. But because of globalization and because of our transfer of information and skilled employees and mobility, funds flow. And with that, the criminal element has started to exploit this, especially in healthcare fraud. So what's the scope of healthcare fraud internationally? Well, the World uh, Health Organization estimates $4.7 trillion, which is about 5.9% lost to fraud. And that is larger than the gross domestic product of some small nations. As the slide has indicated, Finland uh, being one of them. And Medicaid and medical fraud differs from other white collar crimes because ultimately the victim can have harm done to them that they could never get back besides financial losses. Because of such, the, the such profiteering of healthcare fraud. We're now starting to see more than just individuals or individual doctors defrauding um, insurance companies, but we're starting to see organized groups, uh, very similar to traditional organized crime, looking at defrauding uh, insurance companies, defrauding government sponsored programs, health insurers all over the world. Some of the common healthcare frauds uh, that we're seeing, telemarketing, durable equipment, which I'll go into a, a case a little bit later, pharmaceuticals, both in illicit pharmaceuticals, uh, meaning counterfeit drugs, or pharmaceuticals, people pretending that their, their product uh, can cure things, going back to the old snake oil that the you know, Westerners in the United States would have, these people would sell off the back of a wagon saying it can cure anything that ails you. We see kickbacks, bribery, extortion, money laundering, all part of that. Um, in some countries, false credentials. We see that in the United States, but more abroad, where false credentials of people claiming 
that they have been to medical school. They're generating false certificates that they hang in their offices and licenses and things of that nature. Uh, theft of medical identification, uh, protected information of an individual, which helps facilitate uh, healthcare fraud. And COVID-19, the pandemic we're all facing, no matter what part of the world you, you reside in, we're seeing all kinds of fraud related to COVID-19. Everything from telemarketing uh, and test kits that, that can test you and you can have the re in home and you can have the results in 24 hours or, or instantaneously. They're attacking the elderly population. They're attacking uh, middle America and all over the world. Misbranding products, uh, N95 masks that really aren't N95 masks or claiming that their treatment can either prevent uh, coronavirus or help mitigate the causes of that. Um, a lot of these COVID-19 uh, products or guises are, are being used not only in telemarketing, but also on the internet. Uh, also with phishing emails coming back uh, saying that the, the World Health Organization or the World, World Health Organization has uh, sponsored this product false charities uh, raising money uh, to provide food and services uh, for organizations or for, you know, for the needy uh, has, has risen all over the world. Um, pharmaceuticals, grants, uh, the government has, governments all over the world have, have infused numerous hundreds of millions and trillions of dollars into fighting COVID-19. And with those pharmas, and those grants come, uh, come fraud related issues. So why healthcare fraud? Why are we discussing healthcare fraud today? Um, the ease in, fulfill, uh, in, in, forg in filing fraudulent claims, and Eric will go into that uh, in a, a little bit later. Um, billing for higher codes or incorrect diagnoses to, to obtain additional fees uh, for services. They're lucrative kickbacks, uh, whether it's kickbacks from the pharmaceutical companies to the doctors to push a, a certain medicine, labs to doctors saying, use our labs and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll provide you with, uh, with kickbacks. Uh, in other countries, uh, there are kickbacks with pharmas to government, you know, to, to again, enhance their, their productivity. Um, unnecessary or, or additional treatments. Treatments, and that's why I said earlier that these crimes not only affect the dollar, but they affect people. So additional treatments or unnecessary therapies that can have lingering effect on, on individuals. The ease of forging prescriptions or selling prescriptions. We had year, uh, a couple years ago, we had a big influx of Canadian uh, drugs that were counterfeit drugs coming into the United States. Uh, senior citizens, again, are, are targeted in this, uh, coming in from other world countries, claiming that they can have their, their medications at very reduced rates and not what uh, is being paid for in the United States. Um, we talked about globalization and, and, and that, telemarketing, the internet, all barriers are down now. Um, but it's difficult. Um, it, it's difficult in the United States when we're just dealing with uh, investigating fraud. It's compounded when you start cross-border fraud or international investigations. Um, so how are, how are governments dealing with this and preventing, trying to prevent some healthcare fraud and healthcare fraud uh, related topics. Um, the European Healthcare Fraud uh, Corporation Network has 25 members in 15 different countries. They have a memorandum of understanding, uh, not only with the United States and with Canada, um, but with insurers and they're getting together and they're, they're looking at this problem holistically how can we best address these type of issues? 
the UK just in June of uh, 2020 published a government f uh, functional standard. And that goes into uh, looking at all types of fraud, not only healthcare fraud, but now the cabinet office has required, as we do in the United States, um, companies and non-for-profits to con conform to uh, various standards to be put in place. Again, hoping that we can start reducing, if you put some compliance in place, you can reduce uh, these types of frauds. The United States, uh, our Justice Department, just recently in the last few months issued their new corporate uh, cooperation and compliance guidance uh, to, to individuals. Uh, strengthening of individual laws within, within the country, different countries uh, become very important. And just because you're sitting in a country far away from the United States, don't think that the long arms of our Justice Department will not reach out and try to grab you in a foreign corrupt practice matter or another investigation, and we'll see how, how that comes into play. Um, I'm privileged to be on the uh, U.S. Committee on an ISO standard, which is putting corporate governance and compliance-related uh, practices in place, and we'll talk about what ISO is right now. ISO is made up of 164 national standard bodies. So various countries have their own standard bodies. Uh, ISO started in 1946, 25 countries, mostly engineers, but now ISO um, has gone well beyond that. It brings these countries working together to build standards that every country can comply with and certify to. And uh, we're working on standards right now in ISO 309 called governance and organizations. This was first proposed uh, in Britain uh, by the British Standard Institute in 19, uh, uh, 2016 with 38 countries being represented. The United States joined this committee in mid 2018. So what are we working on for these standards? We're working in governance, um, what guidance for what an organization should do to have proper governance, an anti-bribery management uh, systems, whistleblowing, a compliance management systems. There's an ad hoc committee on anti-fraud uh, related provisions that's just getting started then hopefully uh, will become uh, work or way into 309 and into a standard. Right now we have 52 member countries. You can see it's, it's represented by um, third world countries, developing countries uh, to the, you know, to the big six countries. We also have 20 observing members and 23 liaison, uh, 23 organizations in liaison, 15 liaison committees. So again, this is quite large and we'll, we'll be working on putting together and publishing these standards. So it kind of evens uh, the playing field. Some of the standards that we're working on that are under development, I mentioned the guidance for uh, governance and organization, whistleblowing is already uh, a guideline uh, and compliance management systems will be coming out shortly. When you're conducting an international investigation, uh, whether it's healthcare or any other international investigation, there's a number of things that really need to be, uh, you need to think about. And I've listed four that I feel are very, very important in conducting these international investigations. One is attorney-client privilege and with that work product privilege. The other one is data privacy restrictions, blocking statutes and employment and labor law. As a forensic accountant or as a fraud investigator, if you're, being, if you're coming into a healthcare uh, investigation and you're not part of the government, these things become very, very important and you need to discuss these four principles right up front on your investigation. So you have to know your jurisdiction. Um, is, is the company, you may be brought in because um, the government entity has, has started looking at 
a pharmaceutical that you're, you know, you're doing forensic accounting for or internal investigations for uh, as a fraud examiner. So is this company or is this doctor or is this farmer or is this group a subject, a witness, a target? Who, who are the, you know, what are you uh, in relation to their investigation? Um, it may be uh, necessary that multiple attorneys and investigators become part of your team, especially if you're doing something cross-border. You have to do this right. Um, it can only be done once. As I say, once the genie leaves the bottle, there's no putting that genie back in the bottle. The Hague uh, Evidence uh, Convention, which most countries are a member are, will be able to provide information civilly um, across diplomatic channels from country to country. So think about utilizing uh, this convention and doing an international investigation. So international investigations and attorney-client privilege, uh, laws are designed to severely limit exchange of, of data um, outside of a prescribed country. If I'm working in the United States and India, for example, I may have attorney-client privilege with the attorneys in the United States, but the attorneys in India may have very different rules for attorney-client privilege. Um, and there's severe penalties for imposing, you know, for violating any of these laws. While all countries recognize some forms of attorney-client privilege, the privilege is never really um, very clear. Um, as we have in the United States. In common law countries like England, um, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, civil laws uh, in countries like France, there's a privilege, um, but it's kind of in, within their statutes, right? So you have to really look at what you're doing. Oftentimes, we're working with in-house counsel. And with in-house counsel, um, this changes the game quite, quite frequently, and um, it, it, it is a game changer. In-house counsels are not independent of their employees, right? So they're going to look, the foreign jurisdictions are going to look at in-house counsel and whether, whether or not they're considered even a member of the bar or and considered an attorney, or are they considered an employee? Um, in India, I mentioned India before because I've done a lot of work in India. In India, in-house counsel, um, it's still up in the air. It's case-by-case -case basis. What type of advice are you giving? In the United States, if an in-house attorney is giving advice to a pharmaceutical, for example, or a laboratory, for example, that it can be relied upon to provide legal assistance to that, to that company, those things are privileged. Now, sometimes privilege needs to be waived based on cooperation, and those factors uh, come into play. Communications becomes critical. So how are we gonna communicate across, um, across border? Um, what is ultimately going to be released? Again, we need to, you need to start to speak to counsel in those countries to make sure that while you think you may be fine in the country you reside in, if you're sending emails, it may wind up not being privileged uh, on the other side, and you may wind up uh, as a fraud investigator uh, with some real problems. Um, don't create documents that you may not want, uh, want seen. Blocking statutes are um, kind of unique. These are federal laws that limit or restrict cross-border discovery. Um, in India, I can look at personal information or I can look at information that resides on someone's computer, but I cannot take that information out of the country. So again, while we have globalization and we can use all kinds of drop boxes or whatever file share uh, we want to use, if that information leaves the confines of India, 
I can be in a lot of trouble. Um, some of the Consumer Protection Acts in the United States, in the United States, it's not like the European Union where there's a global um, personal identification or consumer protection uh, act. In the United States, it's state by state. Florida just enacted in January 2020 uh, the most restrictive consumer protection uh, information. There is a push to make it the same and make it uh, global uh, as we have in, in other parts of the world. Um, and again, these blocking statutes really start working against what I talked about in the Hague Convention and, and obtaining documentation uh, back and forth. Um, more than 100 countries have enacted some form of Data Protection and Privacy Act, uh, different levels uh, of transferring documents, as I said. So again, a lot of these questions should be asked as a fraud examiner up front before you can start conducting your healthcare fraud investigation or responding back to a government uh, request for information. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so some of the types of personal identif uh, identification that a company will obtain, how is that being used? Where's that being used? Um, again, in healthcare investigations, we have a lot of data privacy information and that's really why I bring this up. So we want to know where the documents are retained. We want to know how we can, how we can mitigate our, um, our delivery of these electronic documents. Um, local language, things may be different in, in far, other jurisdictions that you're not used to working in as a fraud examiner. So again, you want to take the time up front. In the United States in April of uh, 2019, I talked about durable equipment um, and we had over two dozen individuals. It was the largest healthcare fraud scheme in the United States history uh, that came tumbling down. There were legal kickbacks and bribes. It involved durable equipment companies, telemarketing companies. These defendants were located in multiple jurisdictions within the United States and in foreign countries. Um, again, there are, there are uh, arrest warrants in the United States for some foreign nationals uh, related to, to this case. In the United States, um, the premier organization um, for investigating healthcare fraud uh, is the United States Department of, of Health and Human Services. Office of Inspector General. Um, if you take a look at HHS's top 10 most wanted list, two of, the, two of the people that they're looking for, they think are in Cuba. One's in Armenia, one's in Cameroon, Nigeria, two are in Spain. Others, uh, when you go off the top, their top 10, but you look at other people that they want, they're all over the world. This is a global, healthcare fraud is a global problem. Um, I had the privilege of working uh, with Eric um, when I was uh, retained by the Federal Monitor on probably the largest healthcare um, deferred prosecution agreement in the United States when the University of Medicine Dentistry uh, was accused of about $400 million uh, of fraud. And that, that number uh, did go up. There were a number of uh, criminal um, arrests that kind of happened because of those investigations. But Eric um, not only is a special, was a special agent with HHS OIG, he, he has retired. Um, he's a great guy. And this is the fun part of this seminar. So with that, I'm going to put my mic on mute and turn it over to Eric to really talk to you about how the United States um, handles healthcare fraud uh, investigations. Thanks so much, Daryl. It's uh, great to be with you and it's good to see you. And that is correct, Daryl and I did work together on the University of Medicine and Dentistry case uh, back in the early and mid 2000s. Uh, I am a retired special agent from HHSOIG. I spent my entire career in the New York and New Jersey area and uh, as Daryl showed in that very 
first slide or second slide of all the different fraud schemes that are out there, uh, I had the privilege and opportunity as an HHS OIG agent uh, in a large metropolitan area in a large district of healthcare fraud to have worked uh, nearly all of those types of cases, whether it be the drug diversion, the kickback cases, billing for services not rendered uh, and the like. And I also had the privilege of being able to work on the durable medical equipment case that Daryl was talking about from uh, April of 19. I retired in January of 19, so I was able to work on that case pretty substantially uh, until my retirement. Uh, and currently, similar to Daryl, after retiring, I entered into the world of consulting and advisory work and have worked on a number of projects, all within the fraud, waste, abuse, and compliance space, uh, predominantly with Medicare and Medicaid, uh, a lot of it dealing with the uh, U.S. Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is uh, under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, but again, you know, when I was uh, when I was working as a as a working agent, I had the great pleasure of enjoying all of the spoils of uh, U.S. law enforcement, uh, firearms training, and the like. Um, and it was a tectonic shift for me in retirement to spend my day sitting in places where I can eat uh, breakfast, conduct meetings, uh, and work on uh, my laptop essentially from anywhere, uh, and not have to deal with uh, with being in an office at a particular time. So retirement has its pluses, it also has its minuses. So today I thought it'd be uh, good to, to share with you. Uh, I'm also a, a CFE as Daryl is, and, and uh, I know that a lot of times um, certified fraud examiners would love to get a little bit of the background of things because it's all about digging in. So we're talking a little bit about how uh, OIG or Office of Inspector General investigations are initiated, how they work, where the cases come from, how they start, how we vet them, or how the OIG vets them. I talk a lot about data because uh, a lot of the things in the white collar investigative world are all predicated upon data and data analytics and how that data analytics works with doing an investigation. And then how does the OIG consider what it's going to work on? The prevalence of fraud here in the US is really uh, large numbers are estimated to be as high as 10 cents on the dollar, uh, and that may be a conservative number, uh, particularly with COVID-19, I'm doing a lot of work there, and the amount of fraud that we're seeing with COVID-19 related matters is really something that we're not going to, I think, ever get a handle on. Um, and then lastly, talk a little, bit, uh, a little bit about what the life cycle of a fraud investigation is. Uh, within any investigation, and particularly within healthcare, uh, Cases come in that are uh, both reactive as well as uh, proactive. So if we're talking about something that is reactive in nature, uh, it's coming in from what we would call a relator or a whistleblower, someone who is filing a complaint alleging fraud against the government uh, on behalf of typically a former employer. Uh, Daryl alluded to the University of Medicine and Dentistry case that we worked on. Uh, I was an agent when that case uh, came in. Uh, Daryl ultimately was working on that matter from the federal monitor that was put in place. And that case did originate from a whistleblower, a doctor who worked at the University of Medicine and Dentistry, filed a complaint through an attorney on behalf of the federal government alleging fraud within the Medicaid program uh, in New Jersey. Uh, HHS, Health and Human Services, runs a tip line so people can call directly into that tip line and file a complaint or an allegation uh, to the OIG. Medicare runs its own hotline, which is 1-800-MEDICARE, and that is a, uh, an inbox where people will file a lot of complaints that aren't necessarily healthcare related, but if they are fraud, waste, or abuse related uh, versus someone just complaining that they're not getting a service that they think they should get covered under Medicare, of those get those will get filtered over. Uh, back in the days before the internet was as prevalent as it was, uh, snail mail was the common way for complaints to come in. A, a lot of complaints do not come in through the mail as much because of the ability to file a complaint online, email, phone, and the like. Um, people can call the OIG office directly in the area that they live in. There are 10 regions around the country. Each region has a main office, and then there are a bunch of satellite offices throughout different states and cities around the country. Uh, rarely, but it does happen every once in a while, someone may walk in with a bunch of documents and try to make a complaint. 
uh, we typically didn't take walk-in complaints because if the proper people weren't in the office, uh, they wouldn't really be able to handle taking the complaint if it was just, say, an administrative person or something along those lines. Um, generally, though, uh, HHS, uh, although we are the lead fraud uh, organization for federal payers, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, if someone is making a complaint to a commercial payer or some of the other uh, organizations that are out there, a county prosecutor's office, the FBI, uh, or a state organization, the OIG would typically team up with those agencies and those commercial payers uh, to, uh, to work on cases. And oftentimes those cases get referred over to OIG. And as you can imagine, like with everything else, there's acronyms and there's a bunch of alphabet soup. And in the traditional Medicare uh, fraud waste abuse world, there are things known as the MEDIC and the UPIC. And those are the contractors that the federal government, the US federal government contracts with to provide fraud, waste and abuse vetting, complaint support uh, and data analytics. Uh, the UPICs do traditional Medicare work, uh, provider side, hospital side, facilities, durable medical equipment and things of that sort. The medic is responsible for Medicare Advantage, which is the Medicare HMO system, as well as the Medicare Part D program, which is the drug benefit program, uh, which came into effect in 2006 under uh, President Bush one. Uh, the big thing right now is uh, proactive data analysis. Uh, really, the number of, of claims that come into the program and the number of beneficiaries is so large that it really is very difficult to find that needle in a haystack. And so it does require some robust data analytics uh, out there. And right now the buzzwords are not only artificial intelligence, but neural learning and machine learning and things of that sort. So those are very important pieces to identifying outliers, studying the data and identifying where fraud, waste and abuse patterns lie uh, using some metrics that are out there to find where the outliers are, to find where providers who um, shouldn't have a certain type of service or code being billed or doing it. Uh, and really now the, the, what's known as the HFPP, the Healthcare Fraud, Fraud Prevention Partnership, that is a CMS funded uh, program. And that is bringing in commercial or private payers with Medicare and Medicaid. And it's really for the purposes of bringing all of the data of the various plans and programs out there into one place to conduct studies on fraud waste abuse to get these broader pictures of where uh, provider fraud schemes lie versus just looking at one particular insurance program or just looking at Medicare. It's being able to get a 360 degree view uh, of a particular provider's billing history. Uh, and then lastly is cooperating witnesses and sources, people who have gotten themselves in trouble for one thing and are looking to cooperate against uh, others for other uh, cases in consideration for maybe not being prosecuted or for a lighter sentence. So as I had mentioned, there is, as a result of there being a lot of data out there, there is a very heavy reliance upon data analytics. And as this slide shows, you know, as of May, uh, there are a really large number of people that are covered by, by Medicare, uh, you know, under all types of insurance uh, under Medicare, whether it be traditional Medicare or Medicare Advantage, over 62 million uh, people in the U.S. are currently covered by, by Medicare. And in Florida alone, where Daryl and I are, we're in different parts of Florida, it's nearly 2.4 million people are covered under traditional uh, Medicare uh, in conjunction with the, um, uh, with the Medicare Advantage programs. Uh, when you look at Part D, you're talking about over 47 million people and in Florida alone, it's nearly 1.5 million people. So uh, these are large programs and these large programs require some really robust data analytics in order to be able to identify, identify potential fraud waste abuse patterns that may be out there. So we're talking about large sums of data for really large numbers of populations of people in the country. And so it really is all about data. Uh, the things that we look at when we're looking at data, whether it was when I was at the OIG, whether it's now in my consulting and advisory roles, it's really looking at things like the trends in provider billings. When a provider has uh, billings year over year, 
how do those trends change? Did a provider not bill for a service 12 months ago that they're, not, that they're now billing for? And what has caused that trigger in that trend in billing? Did a provider get a piece of equipment that they didn't have a year ago that they now have? Did they bring on new people in their practice that are specializing in things that they didn't do beforehand? So when you look at different trends in uh, provider billings, those are things that could sometimes raise a red flag. It's not inherently a fraud, waste, or abuse issue, uh, but it is something that will raise a red flag because there's been a change in that provider billing. When we're talking about specialties, that's really where you see it, uh, particularly, you know, the example I always like to give to some of the clients that we deal with are uh, specialty trends. If you're an ophthalmologist and you just did general ophthalmology and you suddenly get a provider that comes into your group who specializes in retinal detachment, they're going to be billing for a certain set of services and codes that the provider group didn't bill for beforehand. And that is likely going to do this on their uh, on their spike. And as a result of that spike, it's likely going to cause someone to take a deeper look at that because you've now started to bill for something that you weren't previously billing for. Uh, the big thing right now, obviously, is uh, prior to COVID, uh, and it still is an issue, but prior to COVID, the opioid problem uh, that exists here in the US, it really is a crisis. But one of the ways that you start to see where some of those problems lie are trends in prescribing. One of the things that I noticed right before I retired, I was working on a number of cases and, and a lot of these things are coming out now uh, in the press are because of the opioid issue, a lot of prescribers are moving away from non-opioid drugs, but the NSAIDs, the non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, things like diclofenac and things like uh, lidocaine. Uh, diclofenac has recently gone to an over-the-counter version. Its commercial name is Voltaire, and you can now get that over the counter. So prescribers and pharmacies now need a new avenue to pursue because drugs that had previously been uh, a prescription drug that are now over the counter, that is a business line that they can no longer deal with. Um, other things that are really very data heavy within the OIG, there are two very large groups, OE&I, Office of Evaluation and Inspections, and the Office of Audit Services. Both of those rely heavily upon data for um, analytic studies, um, both to identify program weaknesses within the Medicare and Medicaid programs, but also to identify outliers when there are audits done, for example, on large hospital systems and the like. And the last thing is the OIG comes out with a work plan every year. The work plan is constantly evolving and constantly uh, changing. It is a living document. Uh, and as things come up that present new trends or new potential schemes, the OIG work plan will be adjusted to facilitate those, uh, those issues. Currently, right now, the OIG work plan was just updated recently within the past month or so to include a very heavy focus on COVID-19 related funding that has come out as a result of something called the CARES Act, which essentially resulted in large amounts of money being paid out for COVID, as well as the relaxation of a lot of rules that were relating to things like telemedicine and telehealth, which had previously been a very narrow a reimbursement line of business under predominantly Medicare. So how does data work and how does data support allegations? So this is a, a slightly dated case, but it involves a, a, a provider who was a podiatrist who essentially did nothing but home visits. So he would get in his car in the morning and he would drive from house to house and he would provide people with what he was calling podiatric care. Um, but uh, under the, the Medicare guidelines, which at the time were very strict with respect to the payment for a home visit, there had to be a medical necessity for the home visit. And that medical necessity relied very heavily upon patients being something called homebound, not bedbound, but homebound. And from a data analytics perspective, what we did was we looked at all of the unique patients who the doctor had been treating based upon what's known as their health insurance claim number. So if you're looking at the top line from 2001, the unique number of health insurance claim numbers for the provider was 2,267, meaning that he was treating 2,267 unique patients during 2001, but of that number, only 234 were also receiving 
a home health benefit from Medicare. And those are typically tied together. So really, if you look at year over year, his numbers only amounted to 10%. And then when you get to 2005, that number dropped to 5%. And that number dropped to 5% because I arrested him in 2005, about the middle of the year. So his number substantially dropped because he was no longer able to go out uh, and provide people with podiatric care. The importance of this is to show that data really can support an allegation. The allegation was that he was going out and he was providing a routine uh, nail clipping. Essentially, he was giving people pedicures in the community room of uh, low income uh, buildings that where mostly senior citizens lived who were on Medicare and Social Security. And so, you know, for most of those people, uh, he was going and treating them. He wasn't charging them their copay, which is a requirement. He was waiving the copay. And so it was essentially a free service. And I had people telling me, why wouldn't I do it? It's a doctor doing it versus uh, going to the nail salon where they'd have to pay 20 or 30 bucks for it. Um, so data does help to support allegations when it is used in the right context. From the OIG perspective, within the OIG, the investigative life cycle, uh, uh, complaints come into the OIG, uh, the complaints are reviewed, they're vetted, uh, typically an anonymous complaint with no uh, underlying documentation to support that complaint is typically not really dealt with very much because we want to make sure that we're not dealing with people who are complaining about something where it's really more than, you know, just a, like a sour grape situation. We have to make sure that the patients uh, really have a complaint and whoever's making the complaint is really making a complaint that has some viability so that we're not out there, um, you know, just following up on every complaint. It's a manpower issue as well. Uh, interviews are, are a, a standard part of an investigation. Uh, typically, when you're doing interviews, it leads to more interviews. When you're looking at documents, it leads to more documents. And so interviews, data analytics, um, document reviews are all part of what that life cycle requires. Uh, and then subpoenas. If you're working on a criminal case, it could be a grand jury subpoena. Uh, here, when you're dealing with a federal health care fraud case, on the federal side, you can use what are known as HIPAA subpoenas. And uh, if you're working on a case that involves an administrative matter, you can use what are known as an OIG subpoena because the OIG has independent subpoena authority. What are some of the uh, considerations that the OIG would make in identifying whether or not a case is really going to be pursued? Is there something that the OIG needs to look at? What do we bring to our law enforcement partners? What do we bring to prosecutor's offices? What do we bring uh, to the U.S. Attorney's Office if we're looking at something on a broader scale? And that's really, what's the loss amount that's in question? Uh, is the loss amount an actual loss amount in which somebody has done a review and they've said here, dollar for dollar, this is the loss amount? Uh, is, it, is it an estimated loss amount? And does that estimated loss amount come out of a statistically valid random sample? So are we doing statistical modeling to identify our loss amount? Are we using probe samples or are we taking an actual amount? A lot of it really has to do with what the priorities of the agency and in, in really specifically, more hyper specifically, are what are the priorities of the office that's investigating that case. Uh, in the US, there are 14 what they call strike force areas. And those are, those are uh, areas that are known as hot spots where there are much higher prevalences of fraud, waste, and abuse. And so there is a tendency to only take certain cases out of strike force cities uh, because they have a high probability of being prosecuted. They have a high probability of success. Uh, and oftentimes those cases are known as the low hanging fruit cases. Um, if a case comes in that is a key TAM or a qui TAM, depending upon who you're talking to, uh, those cases oftentimes will take priority, uh, at least from the vetting and early investigative stages. And, you know, just to go back to the case that Daryl talked about, the University of Medicine and Dentistry case, which started off as a key TAM, that case took about two or three years to fully get uh, resolved and get the monitorship going in place. Um, and the the, the documentation was substantial, the number of interviews was substantial, and that was a very high profile case in the District of New Jersey uh, because the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey at the time 
was the state's only medical school and it was the state funded hospital and teaching facility. And so it was very high profile. And so that case really needed to ensure that all of the T's were crossed uh, and, the, and the I's were dotted. Uh, also, we're looking at things like, is, where is the complaint coming from? Do we have a known complainant? Do we have an anonymous complainant? Anonymous complainant cases are not treated the same way unless they provide substantial documentation to support the allegation uh, because we don't want instances where there are people who have sour grapes and are complaining because they were fired from a job, maybe for poor performance or something along those lines. Um, is there a patient harm issue? Healthcare fraud has made tectonic shifts in the way that the fraud is perpetuated from the old days of just billing for something that you didn't do to actually providing and rendering a service that could have uh, irreparable harm to people. Uh, in the COVID-19 space, are people seeking to get um, services that could actually cause harm to a patient? And that's a concern uh, of everybody. Uh, the example I give is the Detroit cancer doctor, Fareed Fata, who was located out in Detroit. He was actually giving um, cancer treatment to patients who did not have cancer. He was providing chemotherapy to them in their homes. Uh, and in their office when they did not have cancer. And as a result of that, there were some incidents of people who actually did develop cancer as a result of getting chemotherapy, which as everybody knows, is a fairly dangerous thing to, to get. Uh, although it kills your cancer, it also has the effect of causing you severe harm. So when there's patient harm issues at stake, uh, the OIG takes those very seriously and jumped in. In the case of Dr. Farid Fata, from the date of the complaint to the day that he was arrested was about 72 or 96 hours. Um, so those are very serious allegations. And then lastly, it's really, what is the U.S. Attorney's Office's priority? If we're talking about a federal case. If you are an office but working in, uh, in a strike force area, the priorities are gonna be very different than if you're working in Omaha, Nebraska, which may not be a strike force city, but if you're, uh, you know, your U.S. Attorney's Offices are always going to have different priorities. When I was working in the District of New Jersey, that office did not start off as a strike force city, a strike force state, or a strike force region, but we did have a dedicated healthcare fraud unit comprised of criminal prosecutors and civil prosecutors, analysts, and criminal investigators that worked for the U.S. Attorney's Office that worked directly with us. Um, in my last year as an agent, uh, the strike force did come to the District of New Jersey there is, by the way, no correlation with the strike force coming to New Jersey in my retirement, uh, although uh, it, it did change the way in which cases were investigated and worked. But a lot of it really is based upon the priority. Uh, and when I was working as an agent, I was happy to take cases to uh, the state attorney general's office. I was happy to take cases to a local or a county prosecutor's office if I felt like that was the best place where the case needed to go. As, a, as an investigating agent, uh, you don't really care where your cases get prosecuted. You just want them prosecuted and you really just want them prosecuted in the manner that's really the most appropriate for that violation. So, you know, as I talked about a little bit before there, there really is an alphabet soup of uh, healthcare fraud. You have the UPICs, uh, which are the Unified Program Integrity Contractors. They deal with fraud, waste, abuse uh, from a sort of preliminary perspective, uh, claims processing, fraud perspective, statistical sampling, uh, pre and post payment reviews. And they deal with Medicare Part A, which is typically your hospital related fraud or things that occur inside of buildings. Uh, Part B, which is your doctor services, durable medical equipment, ambulance, things of that sort. And there are five regions around the country that deal with that. The medic is the uh, benefit integrity contractor for both uh, the drug benefit program and Medicare HMO or Medicare Part C. Uh, and then you have what are known as the MACs, which are the Medicare affiliated contractors. And they are the day-to-day -day claims processors of Medicare. Uh, the thing that a lot of people don't realize is that although Medicare is administered through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, back eons ago, it was known as HICFA, the Healthcare Financing Administration. Uh, the name was changed in uh, the early 2000s. Uh, it is administered 
from a policy perspective and a financing perspective by CMS, but the day-to-day -day processing of claims uh, by the Medicare program is done through contract by the MAC, which are typically uh, commercial payers who have contracts with the government. And again, the investigative lifestyle, if a complaint is unfounded, uh, other issues may be identified. Uh, you may find that you're investigating a provider for one thing, but it may be another. Uh, I had a case involving a complaint that came in involving uh, an anesthesiologist and there was an allegation that he was billing for services that he wasn't providing. Well, that complaint wound up being unfounded, but what we did find that was that he was involved in a very large mail fraud where he was stealing from his partners, which also led to us finding out that he was also involved in a number of kickback schemes. So one thing can lead to another very easily and very quickly. When you interview people, it will lead to other interviews. When you look at data, it will lead to other sets of data. When you look at documents, it'll always lead to other documents. And as a criminal investigator, we're always intimately concerned about where that's going to lead. And from a criminal perspective, a criminal investigator is always looking to get a search warrant because the documents, the computers, the things that ultimately prove an allegation are always going to be found within a search warrant. And whether that search warrant is of a physical location for a laptop or it is a search warrant for cloud-based services such as email, cloud storage like Google Drive, or it's for things uh, like electronic medical records, which are often stored in the cloud. It's all about getting a search warrant for the information to help substantiate that allegation. Uh, other things that you always want to think about, if you're in the compliance world, so if you're working as a CFE and you're doing some compliance work, it's always about, uh, it's always about policy and where are those openings. And it's all about not just being proactive, but also being uh, aware of the fact that people may be reactive, you need to be proactive. And, and Daryl mentioned some of the compliance models that are out there, both the US DOJ and the OIG have compliance models. Uh, one of them, which is the OIGs, is really focused on what to do predictively. What can you do to uh, have a proactive compliance plan in place? And the, o and the DOJs is, well, you've gotten yourself in trouble. What can you do to sort of fix that problem? And the two are really symbiotic. They, they do go together. And so you always have to think about what are your proactive analyses you're going to do? If you're a compliance professional, whether it be a one person medical practice or a large multidisciplinary practice, you've got to have a proactive plan in place to look at your own billing trends, your own data, because that's where it starts. And so what are those considerations? What are you doing to ensure that you are not violating things like HIPAA, that you are not violating what are known as the Stark and anti-kickback -kick law laws here? Uh, do you have rental agreements? Are those rental agreements fair market value? Do you have service agreements? Are those service agreements fair market value? Uh, if you're bringing a doctor in to do work two days a week, uh, is there a referral mechanism? And if there is a referral, uh, is there a fair market value for the work that's being done? Uh, if you have people that work with you that are not W-2 employees, uh, there is something known as the bona fide employee exemption uh, under the IRS. There's a whole list of things that have to be met in order to meet that bona fide employee exception. Uh, if you are a 1099er, uh, and you're working as a, con as a contractor, uh, there may be a violation of anti-kickback statutes with, you know, with that respect. Um, are, are the practices employing individuals that have been excluded by Medicare and Medicaid, not even necessarily for healthcare fraud? The OIG's exclusionary uh, policies allow for some very broad exclusions from participation. You cannot have people working for you that are excluded in which some uh, of their salary whole or in part is going to be derived from uh, program dollars such as uh, Medicare and Medicaid. And there are requirements as a participating member uh, and provider of the Medicare and Medicaid programs and government programs, there is requirements for reporting violations and issues that are uncovered, uh, whether it be uh, through the exclusion, having brought someone in who's excluded, there are uh, self-disclosure protocols that are in place to bring those uh, to bring those back into uh, into consideration. Uh, 
Uh, and you always have to have a shameless plug. Uh, Daryl had his through his entire presentation. Uh, I just have a plain background. But uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, that my company does at Vice Health is we provide uh, fraud, waste, abuse, and compliance assistance uh, for the provider community. And uh, Daryl and I talk frequently about uh, working together on projects like this. And so we're here to help uh, and happy to help you. Well, thank you very much. It's an amazing presentation. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience. I think our global audience are going to be really enjoying this uh, presentation and learning a lot. It's a very short of time to learn all these concepts, but I think, you know, the job that you do uh, both in fighting fraud, especially in healthcare and insurance, because it's, it's, it's uh, these guys, they are not only stealing money, but they are actually stealing lives. Well, we uh, we appreciate the time uh, today to to present to you. And as Eric said, uh, uh, we both were with the government, so we're here to help. If you have any questions, you do have uh, our contact information, and we'd be glad to uh, help in any way that we can. Eric, any last thoughts? Nothing for me. Really appreciate the opportunity. I get to speak for. Uh, uh, I spoke at the uh, ACFE uh, National Conference here in the U.S., and so uh, being able to continue speaking to my fellow certified fraud examiners is something I'm always excited about doing. All right, thank you very much uh, for this amazing presentation. Uh, thank you all for attending our global webinar. This is the conclusion of our webinar.